Hey everybody, welcome back to Plugin Tut, your home for handcrafted WordPress WordPress plugin tutorials. Yeah, I'm under pressure. I've got WP Tuts in the house. The guy who, when I first thought, you know, I'm going to make a YouTube channel about WordPress tutorials, the first thing I did was, is WP Tuts available? No, damn it. So I had to go with Plugin Tut. Paul Charlton, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, for folks who don't know who you are, who doesn't these days with nearly 71,000 subscribers, who are you and what do you do? Uh, well, my name is Paul C or Paul Charlton, as my full name is. And I run the channel WP Tuts, which is all about helping you get more from WordPress from the basics right the way through to much more advanced tutorials with Tools like advanced custom fields, custom post types, toolkit, those kinds of things. So the full spectrum of learning when it comes to WordPress, taking yourself on that beginner stage right the way through to really pushing the uh, what you can do with WordPress itself. And a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in talking about today is, well, of course, YouTube. I think, I think YouTube is, even though I hate the word interesting to like label something, it's... Uh, YouTube and, and WordPress content creation. Uh, it's an interesting space to me. And I want to talk about sort of your thoughts behind you know, leveraging YouTube to do this stuff and where you see uh, this whole game going. But how did you first get into using WordPress? Were you an agency owner like a lot of us doing consultant work, service work? And you said, to hell with this stuff. <laughs> I'm going to go teach people how to do it instead. Well, funny thing is, my original career was teaching. Um, I used to teach adult education. I did that for around about 10 years. And it was to start off with your typical sort of office applications, you know, Office as it's 365 now, those kinds of things. But it was never really that interesting. I was always more from a creative background. So I really wanted to teach people how to, you know, digital photography with Photoshop, how to build websites, multimedia, those kinds of things. And I did that for 10 years, and I did a career change then where instead of teaching people how to do it, I actually went out and did it for, well, nearly 15 years now. So my background was always in teaching, and I just kind of went away from that and started doing as opposed to teaching. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I decided to split off from that business and become more of a freelancer. and I'd started WP Tuts alongside a couple of other YouTube channels to do with music production and Lightroom and things like that. And I kind of had to make a decision at one point because I couldn't do all three. It just wasn't feasible to keep on generating content, you know, three to five times a week on three completely different subjects and keep finding fresh inspiration and those kinds of things. So the other two kind of had to give in favor of WordPress. Um, and I really kind of fell into WordPress more because when I had that web design company, I built my own CMS and it got to the point where I just didn't have enough time to rebuild the CMS to version two and create clients' websites, you know, maintain client relationships, those kind of things that you have to do. So it was more necessity than anything. And I looked at WordPress over the years and never really thought much of it. I kind of always thought it was very, very limited. But then I kind of say, like, I fell into habit to use WordPress, started then using things like Visual Composer as it was at the time because it was bundled with so many themes. Kind of found a bit of a niche out there creating content on that, but then very quickly found the limitations of it and ended up moving over to testing Elementor out before the pro version. And it's kind of just gone on from there. So it was just rekindling that passion that I always had for teaching people and having the time when I moved over to becoming a freelancer to be able to do that and invest my time and effort into creating content. So that's kind of the background story to it or the abridged version of it. You know, it's funny. I interviewed Dave Foy last week, uh, who also has an amazing YouTube channel and a very uh, passionate fit, uh, fan base. And I said to myself, Man, maybe maybe it's the English accent that I need for for my YouTube channel to, to be as successful as you guys. But you both come from uh, the education and training uh, background. I mean, it was the past. It was that it was that passion. 
have you seen an uptick in your viewership wanting to learn WordPress with the world the way it is these days? People who have maybe lost their primary jobs and now they're saying, I need to make a living and maybe this WordPress thing is, is the route to go. Have you seen any kind of indication of that happening at all? Absolutely. Um, I've always had a very loyal fan base. You know, you see comments on YouTube, you see comments over now on the Facebook group and on Twitter, and I can see them in the in the, the comment section right now. And it's fantastic to have, you know, a great loyal fan base like that. But since we've had these health issues that have kind of spread across the world, I know for me where I've kind of doubled down over the last, say, six weeks to create, to try to create content five days a week. Um, and I probably doubled or over doubled my viewership. Uh, you know, subscribers are three and a half thousand a month, new subscribers coming in. And I, I think, like you say, there's a lot of people out there that are really scared of what's going on at the moment. And they're looking, how can I realistically take this passion project, this interest that I've got in web design or in WordPress? And how can I look at ways of monetizing that and maybe starting a career that I've been dreaming of or really fancy doing. But now this is the kind of impetus to get you to take that step because you have such uncertainty in the world right now. So, yeah, there's been an absolute massive upturn in the number of people, you know, the, the people getting involved in the channel, the Facebook group to do with WP Tuts, and just learning, you know, what I'm kind of putting out there. It's been amazing. I've got to be honest. I'm really, really, really thankful for putting the legwork in over the last couple of years and seeing that, you know, people are really starting to embrace what I'm putting out there. So it's amazing. You know, I, so like I was saying before we hit record or before we went live uh, is I do a podcast at powerport.com. It's a lot about WordPress entrepreneurship. And what I really love about WordPress as critical as I am, as I, I'm sure you are of like how the project operates and we'll get into that and stuff uh, and plugins and Gutenberg versus page builders and all that fun stuff. The reason why I love WordPress is one, it provides us the freedom to uh, to build and to curate our own platforms, right? Decoupled from the Facebooks, Instagrams, the LinkedIn, the Twitters of the world, the mediums, but also of for the opportunity that it provides an individual or organizations to earn a living and and create service-based business, providing a great service, a great product at a fair price. Um, I think that's what I, I really love personally about, or one of the reasons why I, I love WordPress. Um, and it, it's amazing to see, like you said, I, you, years ago, you built your own CMS. I did the same thing. <laughs> you know, it was just like you know, years ago, you were like, well, we want to help people build websites and yeah. WordPress. I had the same exact feeling as you. It's like, hey, this WordPress thing is great for me, but not for my customers. Let me build the CMS and rebuild the wheel myself. Crazy talk. Yeah. And today with what we can do with Elementor and you found yourself a, a sort of niche in, 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 in how you educate people with Elementor. I mean, the opportunity is endless with this stuff, right? Oh, it's crazy absolutely. what we can build today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I started with um, Dreamweaver and the Interact products, which were eventually bought by Adobe and then killed off. But they were a fantastic way of rapidly building, you know, using like if you could kind of consider it to be in like where you've got Elementor has the ability to let you create pages, let you create dynamic content, those kinds of things. That kind of did the same thing for Dreamweaver, you know, back in the day. It gave you the ability to rapidly build more complicated CMS-based websites, you know, dynamic content, those kinds of things. And that's my, my passion. It's kind of always been. So I kind of come from that background. Like you say, you'd look at a client would come in and you think, right, I can try to shoehorn their requirements into something like, you know, WordPress or Joomla or something like that at the time. And it was always just more work, more hard work, more frustration because you were always stuck in the confines of what that platform allowed. And at the time, it was probably like WordPress 2, WordPress 3, you know, really early when it was more of a blog than anything else. So that requirement that my clients had, and I just found it so much easier then to think, well, okay, you need this. Let's take those tools and let's build what you want. Let's 
build a content management system that I can create in a very modular fashion. And I can say, okay, well, a client needs these. These are the basics, you know, like your pages, your posts, your media library, like you have in WordPress. But then they go, well, I want to have a directory. So you'd build them a module that allowed them to add their own content into a directory, which is, you know, exactly what I do these days now, just with WordPress and advanced custom fields or, you know, Jet Engine and those kinds of tools. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's great. It's exciting times with WordPress for definite. So now let, now let me flip the coin to the other argument. And this is one that I've recently come into uh, with the whole COVID and everything that's happening. One of the first things that I did, now I haven't been in the agency game in, in quite some time, but suddenly I had the rush of all these small business owners that I know in my community knocking on my door saying, hey, you help us get a website up. Like we need to quickly get an order form for our restaurant or you know, the basic things that you would imagine people would have these days, but they don't. So I quickly, you know, I started putting together some sites, you know, four or five of them. And then I found myself thinking, oh man, now I have to support these four or five websites, or at least teach people now suddenly to maintain their WordPress site, you know, not to go crazy with plugins and themes. These are people who have never had a website before. Anyway, the point I'm getting to is I started to think of the opposite. Now, I've started looking at these other CMSs like uh, Statomic, uh, who I interviewed on my other podcast before. I started looking at these flat file CMSs like maybe for these really tiny sites, WordPress isn't the answer. Hmm. What do you think about that? I think WordPress has a place. And I think every client has requirements that you should always look at their requirements first and the tools you use to fulfill those requirements are secondary. You know, yes, WordPress is great, but it's also one of those things that when you are outside that ecosystem looking in, and if you're not used to dealing with that kind of thing, you know, moving it on to a client, you just end up having so many support requests, so many problems, having to create training or show them how to do things. You kind of have to weigh up what's more important, finding a different solution that may be outside your wheelhouse, you know, things like Webflow, for example, if you want very simplistic CMS or a very simple site, or maybe even looking at something along the lines of Brizzy Cloud. You know, I've been looking at that recently, and I think what an amazing platform. Yes, it doesn't have anywhere near as much functionality that Elementor does, but not everybody needs all that functionality. You know, people want pages created, they want contact forms created, and that's, that's it. And something like Brizzy Cloud, or Breezy Cloud, depending upon where you are in the world, you know, it's that fulfills an amazing requirement. And I think when you're inside that WordPress world, like, you know, like I am, and I'm sure you are as well, Matt, you very be quickly become blinkered to that being the solution to everything. And you look at a client's requirements, think about how can I make WordPress work for that? And that isn't necessarily the right way of doing it. So I think being open to these other platforms, these other options is something that I think you have to be if you want to be, you know, competitive in this market, because, you can lose clients by overcomplicating simple solutions. 100%. Uh, Paul, I'll tell you, my head hurts. My head hurts. My face hurts when I, when I look at all of these page building solutions like Elementor. I just started using Breezy the other day. I'm like, these are fascinating and powerful solutions. Like, I can't even... It hurt, and then Gutenberg is 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 love it or hate it, but it's here to stay, and that's rapidly changing. I just did a video on the full site editing experience that's coming. I'm just like, whew, these solutions are amazing and powerful, but how are they all going to survive uh, each other? Is there enough pie to go around, sort of say? What are your thoughts on Gutenberg and, and these other page builders? Like you said, Breezy is just, I gotta take a moment. It, Greasy's awesome. <laughs> the interface is beautiful. It's fast and it's refined. I'm like, wow, I'm just amazed by it. But what do you think? Gutenberg, page builders, how does this all play out? I think this, the biggest sort of like differentiating factor, the biggest factor we have to take into consideration is what WordPress, the developers, you know, automatic want to do when it comes to Gutenberg. Are they going to sort of let these other page builders carry on doing their job? And then at some point, they're going to go, well, okay, now WordPress is no longer this open ecosystem where you can just plug into and start creating page builders. That 
kills off a lot of, uh, you know, sort of third party companies then doing this kind of thing. And I think to use Brizzy or Breezy as a as a good example, I think they've they've adopted the right kind of model where they've got the Brizzy builder, which is fundamentally geared towards WordPress. But Brizzy Cloud gives them a platform that if something happened and Brizzy, you know, on the WordPress side of things falls over, then I think they've got a very strong business model they could push forward and really help, you know, really drive that forward and compete with the likes of things like, you know, Wix and Squarespace, those kinds of things. Because the, the, the sort of the templates they create, in my opinion, are some of the best out there. And having those as part of, you know, the pro plan, which you don't necessarily have to pay for a lot of these things when it comes to Brizzy Cloud, you can use the entire thing for absolutely free just by signing up for it. That in itself is an amazing proposition. You know, so is there room for all the page builders? I think you'll always have a strong following uh, behind everything. You know, Divi's got a strong, loyal following. Elemental does, you know, even Beaver Builder, which, you know, I've been looking at that for the last, say, week or two. Um, and you don't hear anywhere near as much about that as you did. And I think the same argument could kind of be leveled with when you've got things like, you know, Elemental Pro and the Theme Builder, and more tools allowing you to create your own themes, as it were. People keep asking the question, will we have themes in a year's time? And I don't think they're, they're going to go away, not for a long time, because not everybody wants to leverage the power of something like Elementor. Some people just want that simplicity. Install WordPress, find a pretty theme, download that theme, start creating content. So I think there's always going to be a space there for it unless someone comes along and just effectively kills off the whole ecosystem which, like I say, Automatic could do if they deemed it something they'd want to do moving forward. And we, we never know what's in their, their grand master plan when it comes to WordPress. But, you know, I think there'll always be, you know, you think about it, you go back a couple of years, Visual Composer was the, the pinnacle of page builders. Then Divi came along and kind of pushed that to the side a little bit. And it was better. It was quicker in a lot of ways. You know, there's better positive things about it. And Elementor's come along and done the same thing. And there are some other companies out there that are competing on a smaller level. You know, fair play to Elemental, almost 5 million installs of the free and the pro version. That's pretty massive in, well, four years, kind of their fourth birthday. That's a pretty massive achievement when you consider where Visual Composer was five years ago. But, you know, I think there's always a market for these tools. And it's just if they resonate with the right number of people, they will always be successful, you know, to lesser or greater degrees. That's my opinion. Do you, uh, yeah, no, it's it's a great opinion. The one of the things that concerns me, and we'll, we'll transition to like talking about the YouTube stuff. Um, one of the things that concerns me, and especially with Elementor, because they are, oh, well, at least with the the most recent fifteen million dollar funding and just how rapid they roll out features and functionality. Um, again, my theory is, and 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 maybe you share this, or maybe you don't, but I feel like they have to have a hosted solution. They have to be a new Wix, a new Squarespace to really start to, to push what they can do in terms of a user experience. Like I think that it, what my biggest concern is they just move fully away from WordPress or that the fact is that they might be running a hosted solution that is just, you never even see or touch WordPress. And, and what I am concerned with is what that impact has for WordPress at greater numbers in the future. Because like you 5 million now, and, and in a year's time, it'll be 8 million, 10 million. And, and suddenly they might just say, hey, we've got a SaaS solution now. No need for WordPress anymore. <laughs> I mean, that would probably tank a huge part of their business and maybe they you know don't want to do that. But at the end of the day, I think automatic themselves are sort of handcuffed uh, because everything is, the biggest pool is self-hosted WordPress. And that's a hard thing to control user experience with when anybody can do anything with their WordPress site and suddenly you have 15 different plugin shops all vying for your attention inside the WordPress dashboard. Are you concerned with how Elementor continues to have this massive growth but still leverage the, the awesomeness <laughs> of open source WordPress? Um, I can't say it's one of those things that, that really concerns me because I think with every 
every solution that is created has a shelf life and there's a natural progression with some things you know elementor itself like you say they may move to that SaaS model you know they may well move over to that and if they did you couldn't blame them for doing it because at the end of the day nope. that potentially a more sustainable business model than selling a plug-in for two hundred dollars a year for a thousand licenses um so and yes they probably would lose a chunk of those adopters those people that pay money every single year if they did push over to a SaaS model, not necessarily just a SaaS model, maybe running side by side very much like Brizzy does. Uh, but I, I think everything has, you know, a lifespan. Everything moves on. If you consider where WordPress was five years ago, seven years ago, 10 years ago, it wasn't anywhere near where it is now. And that's not specifically because of WordPress. That's because of the third party plugins, you know, page builders becoming a thing expanding well beyond what you know what wordpress was ever created for a good example i think is to go back to acf when i used that for the very very first time i had a client that simply wanted to have a pdf download as part of a particular post type i never used it before you know elemental wasn't the thing so it was a case of finding out how to use it then getting stuck into the code getting stuck into child themes copying files around inserting that to the template files and it taken a lot longer than what I would do with something like Elementor Pro now. So I think everything will, you know, it's, it's a progression right the way through the entire thing. Everything sort of feeds down through one thing is the chicken and egg, I suppose. One thing will push the other thing forward and that, that will push the previous thing forward and just keeps on rolling forward. That's, that's kind of what the way I've seen it over the, the years that I've been you know, sort of doing this kind of thing, both professionally and doing it as part of a YouTube type thing. So I think it's it's, it's always open and it's exciting for me. I love it. I love technology. I love the way these things move forward. I don't always agree with the way things move forward. Like for me, <laughs> Gutenberg, yeah. Gutenberg is one of those things. I would have rather seen automatic spend time actually making things better. You know, the, the media manager, those kinds of things. And maybe working with a company like Elementor, or Brizzy, or one of those kind of companies that have a track record in creating viable page builder solutions and looking at a way of merging those two together to create what I would consider to be a much better solution than the way Gutenberg was for probably the first 18 months of its life. You know, it is getting better, but it's still not anywhere near close to what you could do with even the free version of Brizzy. You know, the simplicity that that brings to designing pages. Yeah. Yeah. I said that the other day in my last video, they should just, they should have just bought Beaver Builder. And yeah. or, I mean, not saying that Beaver Builder would have sold and, or any of these other folks would have sold, but, uh, you know, make the offer and try to do something like that because the experience is, uh, the experience of just the team alone of building a solution like this was far ahead. And, and not to take away from the team of, of Gutenberg because they had to start from zero and to get to where they are today still the same challenges, but they could have been outpaced uh, or they could have outpaced themselves a little bit if they uh, started with somebody else. Let's transition to talking YouTube and and creating this WordPress content. I, I feel like, and, and you've said you're very interested in tech, you like to see where all this stuff is going. I feel like you have a particular sort of niche in, in what you, you teach. I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you're more of like the medium to advanced mode of videos. Right, of what you teach, um, whereas I might paint myself as a generalist where I am just like talking about stuff that I feel is interesting to me and I'm covering multiple plugins or themes. I feel like you take a pretty precise approach to creating YouTube content. Is that a fair statement? And how do you label yourself uh, a WordPress content creator? <laughs> um, I said, yeah, I would say it probably is a good representation of where I am now. Um, I would say if you took a look at me and what I was doing 18 months ago, I would be more on the same kind of vein as what you're saying that you are right now, which is you were creating content that kind of met what you were interested in. And I've got to be honest, I, I do still do that. If you look at what I create, yes, there's those sort of deep dives in there that are, you know, maybe an hour and a half, two and a half hours long that really feature, you know, creating more complex, more advanced kind of tools using ACF, you know, those kinds of things to build more advanced websites. But I think there are so many other creators out there, you know, I don't need to name names. I think everybody's more than aware of, of the top sort of five, 10 creators on, on YouTube when it comes to WordPress. 
Um, but I didn't want to fall into that thing of what some of them do, which is to keep on, here's the 2020 version of building a WordPress website. Here's the 2020 version of building a WooCommerce website. You know, don't get me wrong. There's absolutely nothing wrong with any of those kinds of things. But I've tried to go back and look at what I create and build a structure around it now that says, okay, you want to know how to build more advanced websites, but you don't know how to start. So I've given you, or I'm giving you a logical progression from knowing how to use Elementor, how to use, you know, sort of dynamic tags, how to use the theme styler, then moving on to how you can use tools like, you know, TPT UI, advanced custom fields, jet engine. And then I've shown you how the basics of those work in, you know, in the, the sort of structure of dealing with Elementor and those kinds of things. And then when you've done those and you are at a point where you're thinking, okay, now I've got a good understanding of how these tools work. The next thing I need to do is how the hell do I put it all together and create something with it? You know, <laughs> something that if a client comes to me and said, I want a business site or a real estate website, I know all these bits and pieces work, but how do I put it together? And that's kind of where the deep dive tutorials have kind of come in. It's like, I'm not going to show you all the basics again. Otherwise, this, this video is going to be six hours long. If you don't know those <laughs> things, there's, there's a playlist there that'll take you from zero to hero in half a day. And then you'll be ready to move on to these more advanced topics to see how you pull those, those components together. So that's kind of what I've done over the last 18 months is go back and say, instead of this scattergun approach, which is what I was kind of doing where, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to, you know, it's that sort of shiny syndrome. It's like, oh, I like the look of that. I'm going to create a video on that today. And oh, that's something completely different, but I like the look of that too. To creating, you know, content that says, there's, there's a progression for you here that says, this is where you are in that progression route. You might be in the beginning, you might be in the middle, but you've got somewhere to go. Do you know what I mean? So that's kind of the yeah. approach that I've tried to put together with WP Tuts, especially the second half of 2019, really focus and drill down onto what I think the audience that I'm creating wants to see. And that's not those basics again and again and again and again. It's how the hell do I pull these things together and how do I create more advanced sites using WordPress as my core, as it were? Yeah. At what point, you know, I, I'm interested if you're willing to share um, the emotional the roller coaster. <laughs> no, no. So the, emo the emotional roller coaster uh, that is, you know, becoming a YouTuber, right? Even though I don't even like saying that, but... When I started, I'll make this a, a quick synopsis because people heard me say this before. When I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna supplement my audio podcast with a YouTube channel, and the YouTube channel, I'm gonna do WordPress tutorials, uh, and I am just gonna go really hard at it." And and like you said, I was making five videos a week uh, when I first started three years ago, and I quickly, and I quickly, I mean about eight months into it, I just burned out from it. Right, I, I wasn't seeing you know, enough subscribers, you know, going up. Um, the content wasn't fulfilling to me and it just became this other task. And I burned out to the point where I didn't even log in. I didn't log in to plug and touch channel for over a year. I, I said, I can't do it. I can't even look at it anymore. I'm so, so discouraged by it until one day, uh, I think I stopped around a thousand subscribers and then it's one day I received like the first Google AdSense check and uh, for the ad revenue. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Whatever it was, a hundred bucks for, you know, over a year. <laughs> and I was like, okay, whatever, you know? And then one, and then it was like, yeah. And then the next month came in and it was like, oh, a hundred bucks another month. Like, okay, something's, something's up here. What's happening. And I logged in and I saw that the subscriber count grew naturally over time because of the, the content that was there. And I slowly started to say, well, maybe I should reinvest in this. What was that ride for you like from beginning to middle to where you are today? Did you have those doubts, the discouragement, the positives? Like, what was it like? Well, uh, yeah, it, it sounds like a car. Or has it, been all, has, has it been all rainbows and butterflies for you? God, I wish. Um, I, I can't say that I've had that time where... I've been burnt out for that period of time. There's been times where I just think I just can't face sitting. I'm sat in front of a screen and thinking I've got to create a video for tonight. I have no inspiration, nothing. And I think I've kind of just learned to embrace that and think there's no point. I will create a substandard video that has no real drive and interest for me. 
But to kind of go back to the beginning of it, I can remember we were on holidays. Myself and my partner were on holidays in 2015, the end of 2015, around October time, I think it was. And we were sat in the hotel room waiting to go out. And we were talking. We were taking bets on when I would get to 500 subscribers. And we were sort of taking bets. So I reckon it would be by November the 27th. And I go, like, ooh, I reckon it would be later than that. And, you know, I, I think we hit. I think I hit it a little earlier. But, you know, I think everybody starts at zero. You know, whether you, you see those people out there. No, you're wrong. I still look up at some of the other guys out there on, on um, doing WordPress. And I think I'd love to be getting the numbers that you guys are getting. I really would. But I think they're getting those numbers because they're consistently putting out those tutorials that are mass market. You know, so as in like the, the beginners, there's a lot more beginners than there are intermediate and advanced users. That's a simple fact. You know, when you want to create something, do you care about things like advanced custom fields and dynamic content, or are you thinking, I need to create a website for my business. Tell me what I need to know and let me just bloody create it. And that's all I care about. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think you look at those. I think if you compare yourself to others all the time, which is very easy to do, especially as a YouTuber or content creator or whatever the label is going to be, you'll very quickly frustrate yourself because there will always be someone pulling bigger numbers than you, you know, putting the same content as you put out maybe after you or the same time as you, and their numbers are like right up there and yours are right down there. But I think every YouTuber has to find their tribe, you know, to use that sort of that phrase. And that's people that are like-minded, have a passion for what you that you're passionate about, they're passionate about. And I would rather have the, I mean, to give you a, a good example of the way I look at it is it's only about eight, six or seven, maybe eight months ago that I created the WP Tuts Facebook group. And again, like I say, you look at some others, they're in the 20, 30,000 people that are part of it. I mean, we just hit just over a thousand. And I would rather have a thousand engaged subscribers and people involved in the channel and the things that happen around it than I would have 25,000 that have no interest in what you do. So I've always been the, 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 a great believer in just, just focus on your own path and stop worrying about other people around you. If you feel like you burn out, step back and do something completely different. Because at the end of the day, your YouTube channel is going to be there when you come back, as you found out. You know, when you came back, the content started to gain traction, which unfortunately, when it comes to YouTube, unless you are someone like, you know, Peter McKinnon or something like that, where you can literally put out a photograph of toilet roll and you'd have 50 million subscribers <laughs> will just run on and go, that's the best toilet roll ever. I love Peter, by the way. Um, you know, we're not all having that privilege, you know, and not say it's a privilege, you, you put a hell of a lot of effort into it, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. And I just think that if you just worry about those things, you'll just drive yourself insane. You know, I've seen videos that I put out that go like this. And then at some point they just go like that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. But once you kind of understand that the way that YouTube works for most normal people, you know, as mere mortals, it's very rare that it's going to be like that from the, the get go. You'll put a video out, you'll have a little spike from the initial interest, and it'll drop and it'll trickle along. And a good example of that is I put together some WooCommerce tutorials probably about three years ago. And one of them was about doing the, the sort of like dealing with um, shipping, which is always one of those absolute bugbears for most people. And that's got somewhere around about 180,000 views on it. And I thought, okay, I need to refresh this now because things have changed. And I did a video, sort of like WooCommerce shipping in three easy steps. And I put that out there and I thought, this is going to be one of those ones that's going to go like that straight away. And it didn't. And I was just watching it and I keep promoting it on Twitter and stuff like that. And it's like, it just trickled along with like five, 10 views, maybe a week. And I was thinking at some point that is going to go up because it will supersede and it'll tie into that other content that I've created. And it is, you know, you can see at some point it just catches on and it just starts to go up and up and up and up. And like I say, I think channels are like that. You create evergreen content or key content that people just need to know about. They'll take time. They're slow burners, but once they pick up, they will gain traction. And when they do, you build content around it to help that have the next thing to watch and the next thing to watch because it's all then inside your wheelhouse following on a natural progression to what you've created. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do now with going back to some of the basic things to create that progression through, you know, from beginner right the way through to more advanced user. So I think that answered the yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely did. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, Peter McKinnon, and one of the things that I've always found to be a challenge with what we do, um, with recording a screen and just showing software and, and doing a tutorial, is it's very difficult to get really engaging, artistic, <laughs> creative yeah. content out around this thing. And I, I talked to uh, uh, Dave about this. You know, I've tried to do things where, you know, you have some quote unquote B-roll in a tutorial and it's like you might show an iPad, uh, you might show yourself doing something in WordPress sort of over the shoulder shot with a camera, that kind of thing. And I, like you, watch Peter McKinnon. I watch a lot of creativity and photography and videography channels to sort of draw this inspiration, yeah. which I can rarely use in the WordPress tutorial world because most people are like, just show me how to do it. Like, I don't need to see Beetle. It's like, I'm trying to have fun here, people. <laughs> so the question is, is where do you draw creativity from? And how do you try to get, you know, sprinkle in some of that, that creativity into a YouTube channel or into a YouTube tutorial video? I am with you on that one. I mean, I watch a lot of uh, other creators that are in the sort of video space. You know, like Peter McKinnon, I think Peter McKinnon's amazing. He's just, He's a storyteller as well as a videographer, and I think that's a very, very fine art. And if you can you can find that balance between the two, you can create amazing things. Casey Neistat's another great example. He could take the mundane and tell a story from it, you know? And I think if you can do that, doesn't matter what your content's about, you'll entertain people. But I think that's probably 0.1% of YouTubers. So to take inspiration from what they do and try to shoehorn that into what we do, that is a difficult one. And I'm guilty of doing exactly the same thing. I've done some videos um, recently which did the same thing, over the shoulder, with the iPad, with the laptop, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, how do you make these things interesting? I think, you know, it is a difficult kind of thing. I think if you do an opinion piece, you know, you're talking about something, you can interject B-roll footage in this, stock footage you know, that, that just emphasizes that point that you're trying to make. But I think if you do an opinion piece, you can tell a story. You know, you can be a little bit more um, creative with what you're saying. If you're literally telling someone or showing someone how to deal with the three stages of creating, you know, sort of a, a payment process or the checkout process in WooCommerce, it's pretty dry stuff. You know, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> I want to know how to do it. There's step one, two, three, four, five, you know, just do that. So I think, <laughs> do we have to worry about it? Do we, you know, yes. I'm sure if we could find entertaining and interesting ways of making these story driven and still educate people, we'd probably see our, our watch time increase and increase and increase, you know, exponentially. But I, I do think that you have to look at what am I actually teaching and what do people want to know and what's more important, satisfying my itch to, to do lovely, buttery, creamy, smooth 60 FPS, B-roll of your iPad Pro and, you know, you looking really creative on it or... <laughs> actually showing someone that's coming to your your video for a solution to a problem or to learn something new, what's more important, you know, our, our satisfaction or fulfilling their requirements? And I think when you kind of embrace that, there's times where you can, in, you can sort of combine the two. But it's also, I think, just understanding what your audience wants, understanding what it is you're creating, and maybe creating a second channel that allows you to create lovely B-roll that has nothing to do with WordPress, you know? <laughs> so, I don't know. That's probably the answer I could give. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Uh, let's wrap up the last question for sort of the YouTube side of things. Um, and then we'll take some of the questions I saw come through the chat before we wrap up. <clears throat> uh, monetization. What is your approach to monetization? Is it ads? Is it a mixture of ads and affiliates? Is it course selling courses, uh, consulting other services? How do you keep the whole engine running? Uh, well, courses is something that I'm looking into. But speaking to Dave Foy, who has been an absolute godsend when it's come to this whole sort of thing of getting my head around how to create a course. I mean, the technical aspect of creating a course is easy. The creating a course that people want to watch, that's the hard part. So just speaking to Dave, he's given me a real eye-opener to sort of go back to how I would look at creating a course. So that's something that is on the cards for the second half, I think, of 2020. But prior to that, I mean, I would say that the two 
key things that, that I've done is I monetized right from the beginning, you know, because it wasn't a case that, um, you know, you had to hit that certain subscriber count when I started WP Tuts. It was pretty much there from the get go. You know, they changed the policy on that. So I just monetized. And, you know, when you get your check trickles in and it says this month you made two pounds, you think, yes, I'm gonna be rich. <laughs> this time next year, I'm going to be a millionaire. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's buy two copies. Yeah, exactly. So it's, I think it's the long game. I think it's building with anybody that does this kind of thing. I think you have to be realistic in creating multiple revenue streams. You can't just say, I'm going to be this or I'm going to be this. Because if you do, you're doing that your typical put all your eggs in one basket. So I monetized from the get go. And like I say, it, it probably took two years before you made any kind of money that would allow you to even buy a plug in, you know. Um, but I also looked then, I was really late actually getting to the affiliate game because I just never really thought, never really thought about it. You know, you've seen people doing it. And I thought, oh, it sounds like a nice thing. I can't be bothered. Um, so it's probably two years at most I've been doing that kind of thing. And, and it is nice. I mean, you, you do find you do come across some plugins that people are not promoting that well. And when you do and you show how good they are, you know, there's a lot of, lot of great plugins out there that people just look at the documentation, look at the lack of any kind of educational material on it, get super frustrated because it's a very complex plugin. I don't need to name any kind of names, but there are, you know, there are a few key plugins, like that, especially when you look at the more advanced type of plugin, you know, for ACF and that kind of thing. So I think you can get a good return on the time investment and creating this content kind of thing. But then there's also, you know, working in collaboration with companies you know, I've done a couple of collaborations. Um, Dynamic Content for Elementor is one of my recent ones, which was one of those plugins that is an incredibly powerful plugin. It's like a Swiss Army knife for ACF and those kinds of things. But the documentation was difficult. It wasn't because you know, Italian is their first language, not English. So creating educational content for that was something that was out of their wheelhouse. So it took a yeah. while to sort of strike that balance there. But working with those um I think it's definitely helped them. They've seen a marked increase in the uptake. So I think it's finding those different things and how you keep your sincerity and your integrity. I will not, and I never will work with any company or product that I don't think is something that I think is good. You know, when I work with hosting companies, they've asked me to do sponsored content and I'll actually go and try their service and pay for it myself. And if I think it's something that I would continue to work with, I'd work with them. I've done it with a couple of different companies and I use, I continue to use them on a daily basis, you know, but paying for them. <clears throat> so I think if you're smart and you look at multiple ways in which you can build it, you can use your audience in so many different ways. And I mean, in a positive way, because that sounds terrible. You know, you can, you can give them different opportunities to work with you, like say, collaborate with you, learn from you, become part of your, your tribe and just help you in so many different ways. I mean, people are willing to give back in such positive ways, it's it's amazing. I mean, it's really opened my eyes to what you can do when you create a great, solid community that you are part of and they are part of. Do you know what I mean? I think that's a big thing yeah. when it comes to something like this. YouTube is massive, but you can make it a very small place by doing the right thing with people. Do you know what I mean? And being just, I think yeah. people don't mind as long as you, you, you have integrity and you're honest about what you're doing. Yeah, I'm like you. I... I I, I haven't really, you know, aside from the maybe at this point one dozen products that I that I really use and or have used and really recommend that I actually have affiliate links for. I, I reject a lot of those requests, and it's no offense to to the product owner who might be pitching me because they're trying to make they're trying to break ground as well. It's just look, I can't just. I make this content and recommend it without fully knowing you and fully knowing you takes time <laughs> and fully knowing the product takes time. And, yeah. and I'd argue myself personally is I'm more interested in learning about who you are than, than what your product's about first, because I, I don't want to recommend something that uh, if I don't know the person, I, it makes it very difficult. And I've had these conversations with theme and plugin owners before, much like you, some of them, uh, English is not their their native tongue, and they're looking at us. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that we're the end all be all, or myself specifically, but 
they're like, hey, can you please make content for us? Because we just aren't good at this, right? And it's a fair ask. It's just very difficult to take that take that leap sometimes. Um, all right, I, I lied. One last question about the YouTube thing, and then we'll go to the questions. Okay. When you started using the thinking face thumbnail, the clicks go up. <laughs> I, I, I held back at that for a long time, and then I finally started doing it this year. It's okay. Uh, I've, I've got to say, I think you spoke to Dave about this last week. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And your alarms went off in your head. You're like, you knew we were talking. Yeah, my ears were burning. I, I think it's one of those things that I know I spoke to Dave about this the first time we had a conversation because I, I, I've watched Dave um, and I never really interacted with him until probably six, seven months ago. And I would like to say that we've become, you know, pretty good YouTube friends, should we say. Uh, I think he's an absolutely genuine guy. And I, I think he's, he's fantastic at what he does. Um, but I, I kind of struggled to start off with. I was very much faceless when it came to, uh, you know, my YouTube channel. I used different things. You know, it would just be screenshots. And then I sort of moved over to use the little sort of superhero character that I just thought was quite cool. Um, just to create, create brand consistency. Yeah, that's the ones. So I mean, the next one is I've got to have my shirt off like this so I can do the bottom right hand corner one. <laughs> I, I, I'm not doing the one in the spandex suit though. Um, so it was like, how do I move beyond this? And it was one of those things I thought, right, okay, I need to stop making it about WP Tuts and I need to make it about me. And that sounds egotistical, but it's more a case of that if I become the brand, it's easier for me to move between different ideas. And if, like I say, if WordPress fizzles out tomorrow, I don't want to be just WP Tuts is just WordPress. And it's now, that's it. That's the end of it. I've got to look at rebranding and start something completely new. Whereas if it's Paul C, which is kind of what I've tried to adopt over the last you know, 12, 18 months kind of thing, so I started doing that, it means that if I want to branch out into other things, I'm less restricted. But also it means that I become the face of, of what I do. I'm in control of, of the brand, if you know what I mean. So that was the kind of reasoning behind it. There's no sort of real um, strong logic there. It's just a case of I need to stop being so anonymous and start embracing the fact that I am WP Tets and I need to make me the front of it. And that's why, you know, everything is now branded up. You go to Twitter, you go to YouTube channel, whatever you want. You'll see the same images. You'll see the same color schemes. The website that's currently there is the old website. And that's going to be replaced with a new one when I can actually get around to finishing it. Um, so I just want to try to create a nice strong brand. That's why the, the orangey red kind of color and the purple color, that's evident. You look at all the thumbnails now where I'm in them over the last X number of months, that color scheme has been adopted and it will always see that orange will be in there somewhere, whether it'll be the prominent background color or part of it, that color is there, you know? So it's just creating that consistency. And I've been told by a couple of people that once they see that color, once they see that thumbnail kind of thing, they immediately know it's me. And that's exactly what I wanted it to do. And I say, looking at your thumbnails recently, you were doing exactly the same thing. And I think that strength of brand is going to come through and pay off. Yeah. 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 So just, you know, obviously joking about that stuff. And it does, you know, it does make sense. And when you actually see it and you put yourself in, you know, put yourself in uh, a YouTube consumer's shoes, like when I'm scrolling for, you know, the McKinnons, the, you know, the, the, the different photographers that I follow and stuff like that, when I, and just mindlessly scrolling at the end of a work day. And I'm like, oh wait, here's McKinnon. I wanna I wanna click or I see Casey's face. I'm like, okay, it's not even I'm not reading, I'm just blindly processing images. You know, and then I see it, I go, okay, my mind goes, that's the one I want to click on. So I mean there's there's definitely a science to it. Let's dive into some of the listener questions or viewer questions. This is not a podcast, Matt. This is a live stream. Um, Pinto TV asks. How do you grow your community? I think we kind of answered that uh, so far with a lot of the stuff, you know, that that you mentioned. Uh, Pinto, if you're still watching and you have another question about that, feel free to ask. Um, hi, Paul. How are you? How do you feel about your incorporation of CrocoBlock, this great company that develops plugins of another scale? Uh, well, hi, Mauro. I already said that name correctly. To be honest, it's one of those things that I like the Crocoblock plugins. I know they get a bit of stick every now and again for, you know, 
some of the things that, that happen when you're using those products. But with anything that's that complicated, there's going to be potential for, you know, issues and inconsistencies. But I think what they are very good at is rolling out updates to fix those problems very quickly. Anyway, technical side out of it. They're a lovely bunch of people. The ones that I've actually spoken to in there, they've been fantastic. And it's been one of those things that I've wanted to work with them for a while. And it's kind of, kind of been on the cards on and off. It's just taken a lot longer than we may have sort of anticipated to get to that point. But again, I think it's one of those things that they create great products. And I've been very open to them and, you know, on the YouTube videos that their products are great, but their training videos miss out some of the key fundamentals that are needed to impart what you need to know for, you know, success with using tools like that. So for me, I'm really excited about the fact that hopefully I can bring that explanation and that understanding to people that really want to get stuck into how you use these tools and get those those foundational skills and knowledge in using the jet, especially the AC, sort of like the dynamic content, not so much the other things. You know, the, the, the agreement that I've got with those guys is that I'm going to work with them on the dynamic content side of things because that's where my passion, that's where my knowledge kind of is, if you know what I mean. So hopefully that will answer yeah. that question. Uh, David asks, would you always go with WooCommerce for e-commerce capabilities or would you just take the stress off and let Shopify deal with e-commerce platform and use a substitute uh, shop part of the site? Uh, this is a pretty big question. But uh, what's your take? WooCommerce versus Shopify? Do you ever combine the two depending on the customer? Hi, David. How are you doing, sir? Um, to be honest, I'm not a big user of Shopify, so I wouldn't say that I would have any real knowledge over using that. But I think WooCommerce is good, and it's the number one for one reason, and that's the fact that it's free and it does a very good job for most people. It just starts to get complicated when you want to move into moving beyond those basics, and then it gets expensive if you want to use the you know, the, the tools and things that they provide. Um, I think what we said back at the beginning of the video is that when you've got a client, I think the solution has to fit their needs. And I would never rule out any kind of solution. So if Shopify seemed like the best solution for them, I may be integrating that into their site, you know, so you have the kind of link between the two, then by all means, yeah, I would say that that would be a good solution. But I always look to try and find the best solution that I can for anybody's requirements if that makes sense when i used to work with clients more than i think i don't really do so much of that these days but yeah the client yeah. always comes with the requirements uh i recently not recently about six six eight months ago um <clears throat> launched a, a merchandise store for my podcast uh, store.mattreport.com and i used woocommerce and printful and combined the two for uh, a drop shipping merchandise store Okay. Uh, and it was just effortless. It was effortless. <laughs> you know, you you installed WooCommerce, you created the products in Printful, you ran the plugin together, and it synced the store. And I was just like, "This is amazing," um, and it works, you know, really good. I think it's fantastic when you have that integration that works seamlessly. I mean, if you can get that, then like you say, it opens up a whole level of integration that you can just literally just plug the two together and stand back and let it do its job. Um, let's see. Greg says Breezy is still missing the theme builder functionality as of right now. EP is taking the lead over most. Uh, sorry, so not a question anymore. Statement, no own version of WP and integrating EP into it. Uh, yeah, I'm just excited to dive in a little bit more to Breezy, just playing around with it. I was pretty impressed. I think it's great. I, just, mm -hmm. I sort of um, had conversations with Dimmy, the sort of one of the, the guys over there way, way, way back, because I think it's probably got to be 18 months ago, if not longer than that, when I did the first video on my channel to do with, with Brizzy or Breezy. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's definitely, the only thing I think that's, that's stifling it a little bit is it's very slow to push out things that people want. And I think it's frustrated a lot of people because it is taking longer than I think maybe they anticipated to roll out some of the key features that they would like to have you know, in play right now. But I think it's just a solid plugin. It's just very good. It's just so easy to use. Another one from Greg Paul. See a detailed video tutorial on Jet Engine booking form would be awesome sauce. <laughs> now, you never know what's going to be coming soon, Greg. Get to work, Paul. <laughs> uh, like to start coding. I thought I saw one more in the mix here. Oh, uh, from Greg again. What is the most reliable screen recording software 
or free versus paid? Free, you'd probably be looking at OBS probably, uh, or Loom, I believe, is, is also pretty good. Um, when it comes to paid, I've got to be honest, I was being a tight so-and-so a couple of years back, and I was looking for a alternative to Camtasia Studio because I used Camtasia Studio in the past, and I found it a little bit flaky with recording. The audio and the picture would go out of sync over time, and I just become a bit of a nightmare to try to get everything up and running smooth and seamlessly. So I was looking for a viable solution that didn't cost like £300, $300. And I came across some recording software by a company called Movavi. They're a Russian company, and they did the Movavi Screen Recorder Studio, which they no longer do. You can you can buy the screen recorder separate to the video editing software. But I would say if you're looking for screen recorder software and you don't mind editing in something, something else, uh, or you want to use their editor, it's a fantastic um very cost-effective tool for doing just that. I think it's about $40, I think it is. And you can regularly get discounts of like 30% off if you look around. So I would say check out the Movavi um, website and take a look at what they, they have on there. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I would agree. So I use ScreenFlow on Mac. Um, I do a lot of video ed editing on my Windows PC. I was always like, it's one of those things I was, I, I was going to look at going to Camtasia or, yeah, Camtasia. Is it Camtasia? Not Camtasia. Yeah, Camtasia. Uh, Camtasia. Uh, but I think it's like, so it's like $300 up front and $100 a year, I think, for the license. And then I'm already invested in ScreenFlow. Like, I've already spent like over $300 on that. I'm like, good. I'll just stay with ScreenFlow. Uh, but if you're on Mac, you can actually use QuickTime. You know, if you don't want to pay for anything, even though OBS is free, you can use QuickTime to record your screen as well. You know, yeah, that helps. I gotta say, I I bought Camtasia last year, and that's why the videos you'll see you can see when I bought it because there's suddenly lots of zooms on my uh, my video. <laughs> you can see I zoom into lots of things now. When when because it's just it. I've got to be honest. For doing that, it's super. The editor is super quick and easy. If you want to zoom in, you want to highlight, annotate, those kinds of things. So I can. I can do all that now in minutes, whereas I used to do it in After Effects or in Premiere, and it was just a nightmare. Just so I, hard. I, you know, I, I just said this the other day about ScreenFlow because I started doing more zooms too to try to really frame up the area that I was focused on in in the plugin. Uh, you know, knowing that most people might be watching on a phone or a tablet, and you know, maybe not on a full screen, so it's harder to see. So I'm, I'm just trying to do this thing where I'm zooming in more. Anyway. I, I, I played with a demo. This was only two weeks ago. I played with a demo of Camtasia. I was like, wow, this is so much easier to zoom in and out of segments of a video stream than even in ScreenFlow. And that was really what had my wheels turning because people don't realize that this stuff takes takes a lot of time <laughs> to not only record it, but to edit it down. It is um, because when you want to do those zooms, you have to play back the video to find out where you need to put the zooms in. So you have to watch yeah. your video at least one time through. And if it's a two-hour video, that's a lot of watching. Oh, yeah. Uh, Richard, whoops, Richard brings up an interesting question. Will you guys collaborate on more tuts? Toots? I say tuts. People say I say tuts. I don't know. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say tuts. I'm not going to go into <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, on tutorials. I'm open for any kind of collaboration. That'd be great. Yeah. I think that's a, that's an interesting twist, right? It's like a lot of the stuff that we've been talking. You always see like these YouTube collabs, with like creators. You know, we won't be skateboarding around anywhere because we're quite far away from each other. But maybe something else. I should make a video. It was just a special effects. We'll pretend we're on Mars or something. It'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, last question here from Benny. In few words, in a few words, what advice can you give us, uh, all new freelancers, to break into this new world? I'll let you answer that. I have a, a, a guess on what you're going to say. <laughs> um, I think the strongest thing I could say is to specialize. You know, it doesn't matter in what area you do. I mean, if you, if you, if you think, okay, I'm in a, a small town, small city, whatever, and you're thinking, okay, what kinds of businesses would need websites? And how could I serve a large portion of this area? Say, for example, restaurants. And I think I've said this in another video before. If you had a lot of restaurants in the area, then become the web design guy that does fantastic 
restaurant websites that knows how to put ordering systems in there, online booking systems, table reservations, those kinds of things. So when someone's looking for a website in that niche, you're the person that they look at and go to. You know, don't rule out other jobs. Never rule out other jobs if they're in your wheelhouse and you can do them. But if you can specialize, you have more chance of breaking into what is already an overly saturated industry in most cities and towns. But that would, be, that would probably be my advice would be to, to try to focus on something that makes you unique over the other people in that area that do the same kinds of things. Yeah, definitely. hundred percent. It's, it's like one of those things that you hear a lot of people say. And when you're brand new to this, you're like, I'll, I need to take anyone who will say yes to me so that I can get money. And yeah. Uh, that's also 100% true. Like if you were just starting out today and you just went down the street and you started asking people, you would say yes to get that money in, but just know in the back of your mind that you should really be focusing on one type of client or one type of solution. Like I do five page websites really well. I do e-commerce for XYZ really well and always be trying to get hyper focus because it sounds great in the beginning, like you'll take in anything, but guess what? In a year from now, two years from now, one day you're trying to build a website for a lawyer, the next day you're trying to build an e-commerce store for an auto parts store, and your mind is blowing up. Yep. Trust me, I've been there with those two exact scenarios. Yep. Uh, the other thing that kind of accompanies that is if you attract the wrong kinds of clients, you will end up spending a lot of time trying to please them. and I put a video out a couple of weeks ago, which was I'd lost a client and I'm super happy about it kind of thing. And it's because it was the wrong kind of client. It was a client that made my life um, just not a not fun thing. I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to do the, the job that I was doing. I did. If the phone rang and I saw it was that particular company, my day was just tank. And that's not a good situation to be in. So if you see a client that you think is not going to be a good fit for you, say no. You know, the money's good, but the hassle is not worth the money at the end of the day. Paul, just over an hour. It feels like we just started. <laughs> thanks for I taking the time to do the <laughs> thanks, thanks for taking the time to do the live stream today. Of course, where can folks find you to say thanks? Where can they find you to subscribe? Facebook, plug away where folks can go to connect with you. I think my, the easiest thing to do is just do a search for WP Tuts on Google or your favorite search engine. And you're going to find me on pretty much all those platforms, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, apparently, and uh, WP Tuts website. So it's easy to find. Just search WP Tuts and you'll find me. It's awesome stuff, Paul. Thanks for doing the show today. Everyone else is PluginTut.com. PluginTut.com slash subscribe to join that mailing list. And if you're interested in WordPress entrepreneurship stories, specifically in the podcasting format, MattReport.com. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.